the only caveat is I'll probably ask uh, my friend, the physicist, Chris Lebrun, to answer. My own science is very rusty. Okay, so last week, as um, Chris said, we were looking at the relationship between religion and science and dispel the sort of myth that actually they're in conflict with each other, the myth that religion and science don't, you know, you know one can replace the other, but actually they're just different ways of looking at the world, different ways of making sense of the world. <coughs> and historically, religious people have often been religious religions, Catholic Church, other churches have uh, been sponsored science throughout the ages. There have been an odd clash, such as over Galileo. And then for much of human history, uh, many of the greatest scientists have been people who believed in God. And so this idea that uh, they're always in conflict with each other is a state of actually a misinterpretation, a misunderstanding promoted by some people who wish to say that religion has no purpose or no value or has meaningless. Anyway, so the next thing we're going to look at then is the topic of God and the origin of the universe. So, the first question is, has the universe always existed? Very important question. Has the universe always existed? So, normally, uh, I guess you all live somewhere, don't you? Or, obviously. Um, normally, you know, you go in and out of your bedroom, and do you notice it? Or your, where you're living, do you, do you notice it as you go in the front door? Do you really notice what's in the corridor or anything? Not really. Not really, do you? You just, notice, you just sort of walk in. What would, make, what would draw your attention, and what make you notice something? Somebody hiding under the table. <laughs> Well, if you notice something different, yeah. yes? If you walked in and suddenly it wasn't the way you expected it to be, mm -hmm. suddenly you'd pay attention. Yeah? So that's the reality. This is the way we are. Mm -hmm. When things are very familiar, we just take them for granted and we don't notice them. <coughs> but when something odd happens, or something is different, then we notice it. And when you notice something, what, do you, what goes on in your mind? What might you say to somebody? How did that get there? How did that get there? Why is it there? What's it doing there? Who changed it? Who put it here? Yes, these kind of questions we start to ask. So when we see something which is unusual, or when we see something which is different, that isn't what we're, when things aren't the way we expect them to be, then we start asking questions. But if everything is the way it's always been, we don't ask questions very much, do we? We just take it for granted. Yeah? It's like a tree, you know. Trees in the playground at school often have been there for hundreds of years, and you just take it for granted it's there. You don't ask where did it come from, etc. You just that's just the way it's always been. If somebody not cut it down, then you'd notice it. Well, why did they cut it down? What happened, etc. But when things are just there, generally speaking, we just take them for granted. We don't wonder why they're there. And so, you yeah. know. If the universe has always existed, we don't need to explain its existence, we just take it for granted. If it, had not always, if, it has not, if it has not always existed, we may ask, when did the universe begin? How did the universe begin? And why did the universe exist? Now I think I should have a different one of this, actually. I don't know why this one came up. Sorry about this. I think I've got another. I think it's another version of these slides. Is it? No, it's not. I don't remember. Sorry about that. I'm mixing it up with another one. Okay. Okay, so. So if, if, it's not, if the universe has always existed, then we can ask the question, well, when did the universe begin? How did the universe begin? And why does the universe exist? So these questions have meaning. You know, if the universe has always existed, the question, when did the universe begin, does it have any meaning? Is it a meaningful question to ask when something began if it's always existed? It's a meaningless question. It's like saying, where's the beginning and end of a circle? It doesn't have one. 
So the question is then, has the universe always existed? Well, the biblical perspective is that God created the universe out of nothing. So there was, not exactly a time, but God created the universe out of nothing. In other words, the universe had a beginning. That's the, the biblical perspective of the Bible. And we know the story, God created the world, the universe in six days, which is not supposed to be understood literally. Why do you say, according to Judaism, there wasn't exactly a time? Because doesn't the beginning infer a time? No. We'll come to that later. Traditional understanding is that is the universe didn't start. It began with time, not in time. Yeah. So there wasn't a time when it began in that sense, other than the time when it began with zero. But it wasn't, you know. It, it wasn't at a point in the timeline. No. Okay. It was the beginning of the timeline. So it's created with time, not in time. It created out of nothing. And the Greek perspective is rather different. So Plato said that prime matter has always existed because nothing can come from nothing. So it's possible for something to come from nothing. If, somebody, if a magician takes a rabbit out of a hat, do you think he really takes a rabbit out of an empty hat? Does it? No, it's impossible. No, it's a trick, isn't it? You know it's impossible. You don't know how he's done the trick, but you know it's a trick because nothing can come from nothing. Can you think of anything that can come from nothing? This is just a general philosophical principle the Greeks came up with. Nothing can come from nothing. So if nothing can come from nothing, therefore, logically, the universe has always existed, matter has always existed. And Aristotle said something similar. He said, God is eternal and unchanging, so the world is also eternal and unchanging. So this is Aristotle's point of view. This ultimate higher, ultimate ethos. Okay, so these are the two different perspectives. The universe had a beginning, and the universe has always existed. So, generally speaking, in the European world, even though people in Europe were Christians, the scientists in Europe, generally speaking, took Aristotle's view, the Greek perspective on science, and they believed the universe had always existed. Yeah, because Aristotle was the master, he was the one who did all the science, and uh, you know, the Muslim, Jewish, and Christian worlds and medieval in the Middle Ages thought Aristotle had all the answers, therefore the universe had always existed. And that was a general assumption of science up until very recently. The universe has always existed. But then Edward Hubble, in the 1920s, he discovered that galaxies are moving away from each other. So he got a, a telescope, and he looked and pointed at the stars, and he noticed that there's something called a redshift, which I'm going to invite Chris to explain, because I always get it wrong. What does it mean that he looked, pointed his telescope at a star and observed the redshift, which means that the star was moving away from the Earth? It just means that uh, some patterns of the spectrum coming from the star is moved towards the red end. It means all the wavelengths got a bit longer. And that's an indication that it's, it's moving away. Okay, so does the light move at different speeds depending on its colour or what's going on? No, no. But, uh, so the light is always at the same speed, oh, I see. but the wavelengths change. The wavelengths change, because so it's which moving away. Which effectively means the colours change. Okay, and that's how that proves that the galaxies are moving away. Yeah. Okay, so that's what he did. And so he said, well, the universe is expanding. Wherever he pointed his telescope, he found that galaxies are always moving away from each other. And so he said it's like a balloon inflating, and all the parts are moving away from each other. And the conclusion was, therefore, they must originally have started from the same place. So if you imagine here, you have this balloon, and when there's no air in the balloon, all these white dots are very close together. But as you put air into the balloon, all the dots move away from each other. Yeah? And it looks like, as the balloon expands, the dots move away from each other. And so if you let all the air out, you can predict where all the dots are going to be. So it's the same way when you work out that the galaxies are all moving away from each other, away from the Earth, at a certain speed, you can sort of turn the clock back and you can say, well, at one point, they were all in the same place. And just like the balloon expanding, the universe also expanded like that. 
So why isn't, why isn't there a big hollow empty space in the middle of the universe then? Chris? The, the balloon analogy is, is only an analogy. In fact, the idea is that the surface of the balloon is the universe. It's not really the, the size of the balloon. It's the surface of the balloon which is, is representing the universe. But of course, the universe is not two-dimensional, but three-dimensional. Yeah. So it's, it's an analogy. So this is like a model, to, an aid to understanding. So when you say everything's moving away from each other, it seems logic. It seems, how is that possible? Well, it's, this is a sort of model to help you to visualize what it means to say everything is moving away from each other. Um, okay, so that suggested that the universe had a beginning. Do you think, do you think scientists are happy or un Generally speaking, do you think the scientific world was happy or unhappy with this discovery and this conclusion? I think they tried really hard to disprove it so they could go back to the Aristotelian. Okay, why would they be, why, okay, so why were they trying to disprove it? Why do you think they were unhappy with this discovery? Usually scientists, when they discover something new, they're jumping up and down and happy. So why is it that the scientific community was very reluctant to accept this discovery and this conclusion? Afraid of all these religious fanatics. That's right. Up and down. Because this, this showed that the universe had a beginning. If the universe had a beginning, the question is raised, well, what caused it? And so it brings God back into science. If the universe has always existed, you don't need God to explain why there's a universe, because it's always been there. But as soon as you find the universe has a beginning, this raises the question, well, where did it come from? How did it come into existence? What was going on before it came into existence, if such a question makes any sense? Etc., etc. So it brings God and philosophy and religion back into science. And a lot of scientists didn't like that because they couldn't find a spot, a place for God in their equations. Yeah. So a lot of scientists wanted to think, well, we can explain everything without bringing God into it. And as soon as you say the universe had a beginning, then God comes straight back in. Okay, so anyway, this wasn't con this sort of ideas weren't confirmed until uh, 1963, when some uh, scientists, some Robert Wilson and Amo Penzias, working in the Bell Laboratories in America, they also had this huge uh, radio telescope and they wanted to zero it. So just like when you're doing um, cooking, you know, you zero the, the kitchen scales before you start measuring the flour, you know, you adjust it. So you do that with the bowl empty. Um, so, the scientists are also trying to find zero for their radio telescope so they could start to measure different frequencies in different parts of the universe. So, they, they tried pointing their radio telescope at places in the universe where it didn't look like there was anything, it looked like it was empty. But wherever, which, wherever they pointed their radio telescope, they found they could never come up with a zero. There was always a constant background radio radiation source, radio source, spread over the entire universe. And then you can see it there, it's so I can't remember what the frequency is. And the conclusion was, because it was exactly the same, as far as I know, all over the universe, the conclusion was that it came from the same source. And just, as, just as if you throw a pebble into a pond, you get these ripples, yes, going out like that. And the ripples get fainter and fainter and fainter and fainter. And if there wasn't an edge to the pond, they would just keep on going forever, getting fainter and fainter, so you've got friction and things like that. And so here, the idea is, well, if you've got this background radiation, this echo, like these ripples, all over the universe, very, very faint, whichever direction you want the radio telescope, it had to have a common source, and this was a relic, you could say, an echo of the Big Bang, because there's no other way to explain the fact that this identical you know, radio source could be found everywhere. And uh, this is supposed to be what it looks like. I wouldn't know how to interpret it. Do you know how to? It's just that there are variations in the, uh -huh. the, the background radio, so it's not exactly the same, but it, it's very, very nearly the same. But, and, uh, okay. but those variations then have become really important in terms of getting some of the details about I mean, two weeks ago. Yeah, that's part of it. Yeah. yeah.
And so they, yeah, they recognised there was something, didn't they, two weeks ago? Gravitational waves. And that led to the evidence of the existence of gravitational waves, which is what you'd expect if the universe underwent inflation, I think. Yeah. Okay. So it's set up on the radio, you know. Mm -hmm. And so this then led to the development of this theory called the Big Bang. The idea that there was a point where the universe began, where the universe was infinitely small. So everything that is in the universe today was concentrated into something less than the size of a pinhead, infinitely small, infinitely dense, and infinitely hot, about between 13 and 15 billion years ago. And I've got more accurate figures since then. And then suddenly, at some point, it just expanded incredibly rapidly. And so you've got this expanding universe, a bit like the balloon, expanding, and uh, you've got the formation of um, particles, atoms, and molecules, and galaxies, and finally you get human beings at the end there. You start looking back and thinking about it all. So what happened at the Big Bang then? So the understanding is then that time and space started with the Big Bang. So we have three dimensions of space, and also people often talk about time being a fourth dimension. So here, it's the idea that time and space started together at the Big Bang. Yeah, so it's that the universe appeared with time, not in time. So there was no before the Big Bang, because there was no time before the Big Bang. So time itself started at the Big Bang. That make sense? So if you ask the question, what was happening before the Big Bang, the question doesn't make any sense because there was no before the Big Bang, there was no time. So time then started at the Big Bang and then space also started at the Big Bang and together. That's uh, what happened at the Big Bang, the beginning of time and space. Okay? Make sense? I'm not really oversimplifying everything here. <laughs> But anyway, that's the way it goes. And uh, so that's what happened at the Big Bang. And uh, so this then is uh, interesting. So this is Stephen Hawking. He was the um, professor of um, mathematics at Trinity College, Cambridge or something. Anyway, he was, had Newton's chair. Anyway, he's very well known. He wrote this book and he said, this book, uh, what was this famous book called? Is it a Brief History of Time? Brief History of Time, thanks for that. And towards the end there he said, science could predict that the universe must have had a beginning. So that's what Hubble and these people predicted, the universe had a beginning. But it could not predict how the universe should begin. For that one would need to, one would have to appeal to God. So that was, what he, that was the conclusion he came to in that particular book. That Science can predict, yes, the universe had a beginning, but to go beyond that, you have to appeal to God. So we'll come back to Stephen Hawking a bit later. So what would you expect from a Big Bang? Suppose there's a huge explosion. You, know, you see these terrorist explosions. After a terrorist explosion, after a big bomb goes on, what do you find? It's just a mess, isn't it? Rubble, a mess, destruction, disorder, randomness, ugliness. So, you know, the whole universe then, concentrated into something less than the size of a pinhead, suddenly exploded, massively expanded. And, you know, the reality is that the universe is not chaotic, it's not disordered, it's not random, but actually it's a cosmos, there is order, we can discover the laws of physics, and the laws that govern the universe, and the universe is extraordinarily complex and extraordinarily beautiful. It's not what you would expect from a random explosion in that sense. And so the question is then, why would it be like this? Why would it that, you know, it's a bit like, suppose that you were to get, to get together all the materials for building a house, all the bricks and all the wood and all the nails and everything, you pile it all up and you say, well, in order to, in order to turn all this in a beautiful house, what is required is a lot of energy. Well, I'm a bit lazy, so I'm going to get a stick of dynamite and stick it at the bottom of this pile of building materials and blow it up. And hopefully with all this energy that goes into it, all the bricks will fall down in the right place and I'll end up with a beautiful house. 
you think that would work? No, not really. Supposing you did it a million times, do you think it would work? Do you think... <laughs> Isn't that a subjective thing to call something beautiful, like the universe is order? I mean, it suits us because in being like that, it creates an environment where we can exist. So we, we think, think of that as beautiful. But surely that's just subjective. Uh, well, I mean, not necessarily. I mean, if you actually look at a beautiful, if you look at something which is beautiful, such as a musical, a piece of music, a symphony, well, it actually has order. It's not just random notes. Or if you look at a painting, you can see there's a structure there that's not random. Random is something like the sort of background noise, white noise you get on a radio. Yeah. So that's what you might expect. But you don't get that, you get this incredible structure and complexity. Anyway, so what were the initial conditions of the Big Bang then? How, what was it like when it all started? Well, the first thing is that it was, it was smooth. So if the Big Bang was too ragged, and then the result would be a turbulence and a cosmos of black holes. So this means that the universe, when it expanded like the balloon, expanded very, very smoothly. Yes? If it expanded a little bit raggedly, a little bit densely here, a little bit densely there, if there's any turbulence at all, then these turbulent areas, they would have turned into black holes. And that's what you would normally expect. And so Richard Penrose, who was a mathematician, he said that the chance of a smooth beginning is 1 in 10 to the 10,123. Okay. That's 10. That's 1 followed by 10,000 Yes. Yeah, that's a big number, isn't it? Yeah. So, what's the likelihood of that happening? You're actually, it's more likely you're going to win the lottery, the big prize in the lottery every day of your life. It's more likely than that. Something like that. Now, if somebody won the lottery one day, you'd be surprised. If they ran it two, one or two days in a row, you'd think, well, that's amazing. Supposing somebody said, well, actually, I win the lottery every day. What would you think? I've been winning the lottery for the last ten, every day for the last ten years. What do you think? They <laughs> you know somebody in the lottery commission. Well, yeah, you think someone's cheating here. <laughs> it's impossible, basically. So for this to happen, it's basically impossible. You think, you know, somebody's cheating. So in order for the universe then to have a smooth beginning, you think someone's cheating. Someone's pulling the strings. It's not what you'd expect. The chance of it happening is so impossibly remote it's highly unlikely. Much more likely it's just a, a, you know, a cosmos of black holes. And we should, if it had just been a lot of black holes, there'd be no light. That we wouldn't exist. It would just be nothing. Nothing to think, nobody to think about the way it was. That's one thing. Another thing is the expansion problem. So to avoid not recollapsing within a fraction of a second or expanding so fast that galaxies never condensed, all right, Dickey, another uh, mathematician, calculated that a one part in a million speed decrease when the Big Bang was one second old would have led to a recollapse before the temperature fell below 10,000 K. A similar increase in stars would never have formed. So if the speed had to be exactly the way it was, just one part in a million slower, is it? And then one part in a million slower, then it would have got to this point here, and then it would have just gone bang, collapsed back in on itself, and that would be it. Wouldn't have happened again. Or if it had been a little bit too fast, then again, it would have just kept on expanding, and the galaxies never would have formed, there'd be no planets or anything. There's one part in a million. So, again, incredibly unlikely. So again, that's another thing. If you look at the weak nuclear force, and this controls the proton-proton fusion. Not that I know what that is. What is proton-proton fusion, Chris? Uh, wait, wait. Two, two protons form a helium. What? 
Let's move on. Okay. Anyway, do protons fuse? Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I just wonder, I, I don't know why they do, or what, what, it, what would you end up with when they fuse? Well, you, you create a nucleus of, uh, of a helium, helium matter. Okay, so that's what it is. No, okay. Yeah, it's, you know, so then, all right. Okay, so weak nuclear force controls proton proton fusion to create helium nuclei. Helium. So if this is a bit stronger, all the matter will become helium and heavier elements. And if it all become helium and hel heavier elements, there will be no water, because water requires hydrogen, which is a single proton. And the sun will explode instead of burning. If it is a little bit weaker, there will be only helium, since the weak nuclear force makes neutron neutrons decay into protons. So again, this weak nuclear force, with the nucleus had to be exactly the way it was, otherwise, again, you wouldn't have had hydrogen, there would be no water, and there'd be no life. We wouldn't be here talking about it. Then a strong nuclear force, a 2% increase and quarks would not turn into protons and there'd be no hydrogen. A 5% weakening would unbind the deuteron and there'd be no elements heavier than hydrogen. So again, if the strong nuclear force is just slightly different to what it is, again, you wouldn't have all the heavier elements, so again, there wouldn't be carbon and all the things necessary for life in the uh, periodic table. And again, electromagnetism. So this is uh, I think Maxwell who came up with these equations, you know, explaining how electricity and magnetism are different dimensions of the same basic force. And a change of just one part in 10 to the 40, so that's 10 followed by 40 zeros, one part in 10 to the 40 would affect star formation. Slightly stronger and they would be red stars, and too cold, slightly weaker, and they would be blue, very hot, radioactive, short-lived. A double strength of being a 10 to the 62 years would be needed for life to evolve, by which time all the protons would have decayed. So just doubling the force would mean, again, no possibility of there being life on the, in the universe. And then the gravity, gravity is 10 to the 39 times weaker than electromagnetism. A slight change in this proportion would prevent at its actual strength, it was possible for clouds to form stable stars which do not fragment. So again, from gravity also, and relative to the strength of electromagnetism, has to be pretty much exactly this kind of this kind of ratio. So this is a kind of a puzzle. So how can we explain this? How do you explain this? Any ideas? I'm supposing anybody here do anyone here bake cakes? Yep. You bake cakes? Sometimes. Yeah, okay. Now supposing you went into a kitchen and you were told to bake a cake, but it's a kitchen you've never been in before and you've never cooked in it before and you were blindfolded. Okay? And you're told now go and bake a cake. So you had to find your way around the kitchen opening the covers, trying to find the flour, okay, and then you have to weigh out the flour without being able to look at the scales. You have to find the butter or margarine, measure that out, the right amount, the right amount of milk or water, whatever, sugar and everything else you put in. Then you have to figure out, blindfolded, with how this oven works that you've never used before, and what, what you know, knob you should switch it on to how to get the temperature exactly right, and then you put the mix in the oven, and you leave it in there for an amount of time. What's the likelihood of you baking a nice cake? Reduced. <laughs> Just reduced. <laughs> Even if I follow instructions, I can break, I still make a horrible cake. Yeah, okay, so I, yeah, if you follow the instructions, you still make a horrible Some part of it rises, another part of it just collapses. So 
So it has to be completely smooth. Um, you know, the likelihood of this happening is you saw one part in uh, 10 to 1,000. And everything had to be exactly like that. So how do you explain this? Well, one more recent scientific answer is the idea that, God, that gravity created the universe. So you have Stephen Hawking again, his most, his most recent book called The Grand Design. And he said, because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is a reason there is something rather than nothing. Why the universe exists, why we exist. So that was Stephen Hawking, who doesn't believe in the existence of God, a person of God. He said, okay, the way, the way to explain this is that gravity created the universe. So what do you think about this answer? Gravity created the universe. <laughs> what, are the, what questions are left are begging here? Why did gravity Sorry? why did gravity create yeah. the universe? But what, what, why, what, why is there gravity? Yeah, okay, so it's the universe came into existence because gravity exists. But, well, that only asked, raised the question, well, why is there gravity? Why is there a law of gravity? And so it's not actually answering the question, it's just putting it off. And then from his point of view, okay, if gravity created the universe, that, does that mean gravity is God? Gravity is Does scientists think gravity existed before the Big Bang? defer to Chris here. And it wasn't it before. <laughs> <laughs> so it's infinite density then, so there must have been some heavy gravity. Well, yeah, okay, so this is, I mean, this is like Stephen Hawking. He said, because there is a law such as gravity, so is gravity a law, or is gravity a force? I mean, there's a law which describes the force of gravity. Well, I think he means, he means the law, and, and, and he's He's just making that as an example. I think he means the laws of physics or mathematics. And I think he probably sees mathematics more as, as God. Okay. Everything comes out of mathematics. Right. And then, but of course, that begs the question. So, you know, it's his perspective. So it looks like for him, the law of gravity is God. I mean, a religious perspective, one would say, well, yeah, is gravity or is gravity an expression of the universal prime force of God? So from a religious, a biblical perspective, say, you know, God is a God of heart, a God of love, but also God is a God of power. So in that sense, the power of the force, gravity then, is an expression of God's power or God's force. That makes sense? And so when Hawking says gravity spontaneously and naturally caused the universe to come into being, the Big Bang, one would have to say yes or no. Yes, he's right, because gravity is one expression of the power of God. Yeah, that's where gravity comes from, it's an outward expression of God's power. That make sense? Or no, is that helpful? No? Because you wouldn't say that the expression itself became the cause. Hmm? You, uh, it doesn't make sense to say that the expression, if gravity is an expression of what we think of as the cause of the universe, then the, ex the expression came into existence at the same time that the actual thing came into existence. No, but the uh, parallel existed well, in the beginning of. Well, you would say that God is always existing, God is eternal. Yeah. And God is a source of infinite power. And so, in that sense, and gravity is one aspect or one way of descri describing that power, and it had always existed. But uh, a characteristic and an expression are two different things, aren't they? Yeah, I'm just modeling my words up trying to describe something and describe it. Okay, so how do we explain this? Well, another way is to say that the laws of science created the universe. So again, this is Hawking again. He said that this is on Channel 4 a couple of years ago. He said the question is, is the way the universe began chosen by God for reasons we cannot understand, or was it determined by a law of science? I believe the second. If you like, you can call the laws of science God, but it wouldn't be a personal God that you could meet and ask questions. So what do you think about that statement? 
who says, the problem is, is the way the universe began either chosen by God or science? Um, for reason, and by God for reasons we cannot understand, or was it determined by the laws of science? How would you analyse that statement? seeing science as the entirety. So what, um, so what authority does would he have to say make that statement? Yeah. He's, he's saying whether it's, it's either the laws are created by God or defined by science. Right. So he's saying one or the other, but in both instances he's saying that the laws are specific and chosen. And so what, what assumption is he making here? There's an assumption in the first statement, first sentence. Oh, you're assuming that the universe had a beginning or a cause? No, we know that the universe had a beginning. What is, this, what is an assumption there? Well, he's well, assuming that if, if, if there's a God, then, then we can't understand. Yes. He's Whereas saying, science, fine. we can understand. Yes. So he, has, actually, he himself would probably said the reverse if you explore it further. Right, so he's saying, Either the universe is chosen by God for reasons we can't understand. Is it true we cannot understand why God created the universe? Yes. Hmm? Yes. Yes? No one has the evidence that why it's happened. Uh, well, I think we can understand why God created the universe. I think Stephen Hawking doesn't understand why God created the universe. But every religion, most religions give an explanation of why God created the universe. So, so, for example, the biblical perspective would be God created the universe and God created human beings because God is love, but love is something you, you cannot experience by yourself, you want to share with another being. And so because God is love, then God created beings, human beings, with which he could share his love and form a relationship of love. So in order to create beings to which he could have experienced this kind of joy, then God created the universe. So one can give reasons, logical reasons, for why God created the universe. So in that sense, what Hawking is saying here is an assumption. He's assuming, he's saying, we, don't, we can't understand why God created the universe, but a lot of religious people say, actually, we can know why God created the universe. Um, or we can come up with reasons why we think God created the universe. Also, why is not a scientific question, is it? Yeah. It's a philosophical or metaphysical question. Yeah, but everybody asks it. Yeah. But I, mean, but I mean, you can't just assume because you're a scientist that science has the tools necessary to discover the why. It depends because why pertaining to purpose is obviously more of a religious question. But scientists often ask, ask the question why. Why does water, why does, I, why does ice melt? Into yeah, water? but what they're really asking is how when you say that. Yeah, but they say why, but so it's just the different meanings of why, it's not all yeah, yeah. context of why. Anyway, so that, I mean, that's Hawking's assumption, we, we can't know why God created the universe. Yeah. So on that basis he dismisses the idea that God created the universe. But if he if one did come up with an explanation, a very convincing explanation, why God created the universe, what motivated God to create the universe and to create human beings, to create us, you'd have to say, well actually one can answer that question. And so the creation of the universe by God is plausible, it is an alternative. And uh, so it is, so again, was it determined by the law of science? So can't we know why God created the universe? And then the other thing he says, okay, you can call the laws of God science, but it wouldn't be a personal God that you could meet and ask questions to. So again, is that true or not? Is it possible to ask God questions get answers. No. Well, hmm? In the only books, um, there is a scenario that you ask questions and God uh, answers your questions. But I think it's just an illusion. Anyway, I mean, you may think it's an illusion, but throughout human history there have been lots of people who claimed that they had a revelation from God. Um, oh. So, you know, and then they wrote down this revelation in these books of scripture, the Quran or the Bible or you know, other religious 
books of scripture. So there were people in human history, and there were people who were mad. There were people who were incredibly sane, incredibly normal, and incredibly good. And these people claimed that they spoke to God, and God told them things, and they wrote these things down. So it's not that everybody is able to ask God questions and get answers, but there certainly have been some people who have. Yes, John. Why are there so many inconsistent uh, seeing what they're saying about origin of God? Why are there so many inconsistencies? Yeah. Why do you think? Well, uh, one reason is each of these, uh, a lot of these revelations are written in particular languages, and every language has its own. Is, you know, ultimately, you can't have a perfect translation from one language into another, because all languages are socially constructed, and they all have their own nuances. Do you speak Japanese? Okay, is it possible to translate direct, perfectly from Japanese to English? No. And so, one concept in one language is incommensurable with another language. You can't have that. And so, a lot of these differences are in, the rev in the content of the revelation are due to the fact that they're expressed in different languages. And also, these languages are rooted in different cultures with different experiences, and so the vocabulary is different. That's one of the, that's one of the reasons. So would you say there's more more to more to the origin of the um, universe? So you can say there's the one truth and there's another truth that could have the origin of God. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Now what I'm trying to say is that yeah. can you actually be dogmatic of origin of God? About what? Origin of the universe. Well, you can't be dogmatic. I mean scientists are still trying to figure it out. Yeah. Um, but then the language that science uses is mathematics. And, you know, mathematics is kind of you know, a universal language in that sense. So is it, is it possible to question what's written in the scriptures? Oh yes. Yeah, it's possible to, and people do. Yeah, people do all the time, and they say, well, does this make sense? Or, you know, because often these things are written by people thousands of years ago. So you might think, well, this doesn't make sense to me today. In which case I'll ignore it. Or you might think, well, what did this mean to the people who wrote it all those years ago? So it's like sort of, you know, literary criticism. If you read Shakespeare today in English, you usually need some notes. But you can generally speak, you make fairly, quite a lot of sense of it. If you go back before Shakespeare, <coughs> Chaucer, it's almost foreign language, you can't read it, unless you learn the old English. And you go back before Chaucer to Beowulf, and it is completely like gobbledygook. And that's not very long ago, it's only 1600 years ago. Um, so when you're reading scriptures that were written thousands of years ago, you have to, you know, have to work really hard to try and understand the language and the worldview that this language represented, and the culture of the people who use this language and what these different expressions meant to them. And sometimes we can recover it, but there are lots of things we just can't recover. Um, you know, it's like modern, you know, it's like slang that, you have, that children use. You know, they have all those little slangy words, which only they understand, adults hear it, and they can't figure out what they're talking about. Well, they can understand. But then if children today listen to the slang that children of the same age were using 50 years ago, would they be able to understand it? No, but everyone's forgotten it now. So lots of these languages, in that sense, and expressions, are just, the meaning is lost. So that's part of the problem with all scriptures. You have to work really hard to, to uncover the meaning. Well, would you fully understand what's written in scriptures? Like, well, I mean, if you haven't experienced what they were experiencing, how would you understand it? Right, and so there's some, so, I mean, that's a real problem. I mean, you can never completely go back, because any, any text has more than one meaning. There's several meanings. It's the same in reading any book written today. You know, different people get different things out of the same book. You listen to book club on the, on the radio or four. You know, three or four people read the same book and they get different things out of it because different parts of the text speak to them in different ways. They can relate to one character but not to another. So that's even with modern literature. So of course, you go back to ancient literature, it's even more the case. It's very difficult. You know, so lots of sayings in the Bible which in English don't make, mean anything. But, because the Bible wasn't written in English for one thing, but if you go back to the Hebrew 
And then Jewish people, often they have a much better sense because they're still speaking Hebrew. So you can get a much closer understanding of the nuances and meanings of the words. So Jesus, for example, he spoke Hebrew and Aramaic. And a lot of the expressions in the New Testament, when they're translated into English, they don't make sense. But if you were to go back to the Hebrew and cite it in the terms of the first century Palestine, then it makes a lot more sense. And so it's a lot more work to try to understand these things. And then, you know, as I said, every language is different. So if you think in one language, you feel different, you see the world differently than if you think in a different language. Can you think in, can you change from thinking in Japanese, thinking in English? And does the world look different? And, uh, 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 and when you're speaking, when, you, when you're in a Japanese environment, when you're speaking to other Japanese people just in Japanese, and then you're just in an English environment, you're speaking just in English, do you feel like, do you feel within yourself there's something different about who you are? Less, yes. Sorry? More or less, yes. More or less. I mean, there are differences. Yeah. Because each language structures the relationships differently. So, for example, in Japanese, much more hierarchical when you're speaking to someone older than you or younger than you, using a different grammatical form. So in that sense, you're taking the position of, oh, now I'm speaking as a younger person to an older person, or as an older person to a younger person. But English doesn't have that kind of thing. So it's much flatter in that sense. And so you don't feel or conceptualize yourself as you know, structured according to the, this particular language. Or you're structured differently, depending on the language which you're thinking and seeing the world in, through. So all these things are different. So in that sense, is there a perfect language? I don't think so. I think there are lots of different languages. No, and each... not a... hmm? so, so, sorry? So, can I ask you? Yeah, that's also, So, in that conclusion, would you say all the scriptures and sacred, sacred tradition of the world has validity, not just one religion? They're all valid in the sense that they all give a valid ex <coughs> revelation of ultimate of the meaning of ultimate questions to the people at that particular time. And sometimes you can't get into it. It's just completely other. So there's some scriptures you can read of dead religions. And you can read it and you just can't get into it. Whereas there's some, I mean the Bible, because it's you know, this sort of living tradition, you can read it and there's a certain amount of it that's very, very familiar. And you can get into it. Um, but, you know, so... Yeah, I mean, the people, still the people who wrote these things, they were still human beings like us. They still had the same emotions and feelings and thoughts and that, 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 and that. But the language is different, the culture is different. So there are some aspects of it which are universal because of the fact that they were human beings. So you read the Bible and it talks about hatred and anger and love and jealousy and all the different emotions that we feel ourselves. And you can relate to a lot of these characters in the Bible and the experiences that they went through because there is something universal about these stories. The same with Shakespeare. You know, Shakespeare also, even though he was writing 500 years ago, there was something universal about human nature that he was able to catch, such that it, you know, is still readable today. And it's the same with the Greek plays. You know, they were written more than 2,000 years ago. And when you read these plays, you can see that this aspect of a universal human nature, which is why people still read them today. But there again, as I said, there's some things which are so... I mean, even, even modern novels, there's some things which 50 years ago everybody thought this is amazing, this is, everyone's reading it, and 50 years later you pick it up and that's really boring. You know what I mean? Because culture changed. Yeah. And fashions changed very rapidly. So there's some things which trans... There's some classical pieces of literature, and scripture is one example, which which transcend fashion in that sense. You know, they've touched something universal about the human experience. Whereas there are lots of other pieces of literature which just are momentarily fashionable, but then within a few years it's kind of stale. Yeah. Make sense? And so scripture by definition is something which has been read and reread and reread and people keep reading it and new editions have brought out. Whereas there are lots of books which were published, which at the time people thought were the bee's knees, which just fell into, in, they just weren't reprinted. They were. So the scripture, I mean, the meaning of the scripture is just you, it's, a, it's literature that's been read 
and read and reread and for this reason. Um, but sometimes it, you know, it's very difficult to get into. And yeah, in that sense, there's no perfect scripture because every scripture is written in a particular language, every language is historically and culturally conditioned. And so the most perfect language is mathematics, in that sense, because it transcends history and nationality and, you know, when physicists meet, you know, they may speak different languages, but the maths is the same. And I guess it will probably always be like that. But then... And that doesn't have the personal. That's the point. It doesn't have the personal, that's the point. Yeah, exactly. You can't, the, you can't write a novel in, in, in maths. In using numbers and algebra and everything. Well, not yet. <laughs> William, about 150 years or so, Maxwell, when he was trying to understand the relationship between electricity and magnetism, he actually reached a point where he was really stuck. And then there's a story about where he had a dream or some inspiration. And just through blind intuition, he, he researched something, and it turned out to be a perfect discovery. And things like that can happen with intuition. And I think uh, if you look at the Bible, many people thought God was talking to Moses, but if you look at the part of the burning bush, it says in the, even in the New Testament, it was an angel talking to Moses, jo the angel Jehovah. And so, when you say you can ask God a question and God can answer it, um, is that in a broad sense meaning people can get communication from scientists who have already gone to the spirit world and somehow can communicate a, a feeling or an intuition to them? Or do you mean a direct answer can God? All right, well, people like Maxwell, it's not that they, want, they woke up one day and came to the answer. Actually, before then, they put in a huge amount of work. Yeah, of course. They read zillions of books, did all kinds of experiments, they fought and fought and fought, they got a real headache. And eventually, the sort of unconscious, subconscious, the sort of subconscious part of their mind, all this information which they'd taken in through all the books they'd read and the hard work they did, all this was being processed mm -hmm. in their unconscious. Yeah. And then one day, oh, that makes sense. So it's not, in that sense, a revelation. It's some, it was the mind, the deeper part of the mind was processing all this information and working out the patterns. But it could only do that because they put in the effort and the work. Um, so in terms of speaking to God, I think it's not, oh, well, I'm going to ask God a question today and get an answer. But again, when you look at people who have had these kind of revelations or experiences, it's usually because they've also put in a huge amount of work. Mm -hmm in terms of the spiritual life, and fasting and praying, you know, reading and studying, and then they get some kind of encounter, divine encounter, spiritual experience. I think it's, you know, sometimes people say it's from God, sometimes people say it's from an angel, sometimes people explain it differently. And Muhammad, for example, he said an angel came and dictated these things to him. Um, whereas many of the prophets in the Old Testament, they say it was actually God. So then, you know, I just take these things as it says, really. What's your personal opinion? What? I think I'm to experience a God. I don't think it's easy, but I think it's possible. So you don't believe that uh, God exists? Oh, yes. I mean, I think it's, I can't, for me, it's not possible to explain why the universe exists and why there is all the universe like it is, without assuming the existence of God. So do you place yourself um, on the Stephen Hawking's theories, or God's theories? So, I think Stephen Hawking is a great scientist, but I don't think he understands very much about theology. And so lots of the statements he's making here about God are very naive. Mm. Yeah, because he understands science and math very well, but he doesn't understand philosophy very well. He doesn't understand theology very well. So lots of things he says here about God, for reasons we cannot understand. Well, there are lots of religious people who would claim we can understand why God created the universe. So maybe Hawkins hasn't read these books. Maybe he's read lots of science books, but maybe he hasn't read those kind of books. And so for him, he can't understand why God created the universe. But that's because he can't understand why God created the universe doesn't mean that other people haven't worked it out, mm -hmm. thought about it and come up with good reasons. And so again, his conclusion here, he wouldn't be a personal God. So, but then when you read you know, religious literature, you can find many people who have had an experience with God and they describe this as a personal experience. 
that God is personal, that God knew them personally. Now it's not everybody, but you can find there uh, have been people like this. So just because Stephen Hawking himself hasn't had a personal experience with God, it doesn't mean that nobody else has. Yeah? So he's, he's extrapolating from his own personal experience, he's generalizing from his own personal experience and coming to some general conclusion, which is not good science. Yeah, it's, not, it's not a good argument. I haven't had a personal experience with God, therefore it's impossible nobody else can. Understand? So it's, a, it's not a good argument. So he's a great scientist, but he's not very good at philosophy. That's all. It's a bit like you know, a person who's born blind. They may say, well, there is no such thing as light. I mean, just because they can't see, doesn't mean that other people can't see. But just because they can't imagine what it is to see color, doesn't mean that other people cannot see color. I mean, for example, I'm colorblind. So there's some colors which I can't tell the difference between. And, some to, and I remember once I was complaining about a PowerPoint presentation somebody did because I couldn't see the writing. And I said, why have you, why, why, you know, why have you chosen that font color? Because it's just the same as the background. <laughs> and he said, well, I can understand it. And I asked somebody else, well, I can read it. And I was, the problem wasn't with the font. The problem wasn't with the PowerPoint. The problem was I'm colorblind. So just because I couldn't read it, didn't mean nobody else could. You understand? So, that, that, so that's, a, you know, that's the kind of conclusion argument Stephen Hawking has used. That's not a good argument. Okay, so in that sense, you know, how does Stephen Hawking know that God is not personal? So Stephen Hawking then he admits to God, but not a personal God, with whom one can form a relationship and who loves him. So he admits God exists, he just calls God's laws of science, which isn't really very sensible, really. Because how can the laws of science, I mean, a law is just a description of a pattern. In the law of gravity says that when I let go of this, it's going to go downwards and it's going to come into contact with this table at a certain rate of acceleration. Yes? Something like that. Velocity. Velocity. Anyway, you can work out the rate of acceleration of that. So all the, all the law science is doing is just describing what happens, that's all. It's saying this is a pattern and if this happens then that will happen. So in that sense a law is just a description of a pattern. So again here, when he talks about a law of science doing anything, laws can't do anything because laws themselves are just descriptions of patterns of behavior. So again, this is another perspective. Quantum fields created the universe. So this is a book called by somebody called Lawrence Krauss, who's a quite a well-known physicist. He said, the universe from nothing. Why, there is something from nothing. So he said, the total energy of the universe is zero. Apparently. Can you explain that? Oh, yeah. Well, I've not heard of his theories before. Okay, anyway, apparently the total, universe, the total energy of the universe is zero. I'm not quite sure what that means, but that's apparently... Mathematical, zero is part of the... Yeah. The numbers. Yeah, so anyway. Is, uh, I think it is a, a, um, a balance. Well, yeah, so that's the argument that when you do all the maths and all the sums, it comes up with a zero. The total energy of the universe is zero. Anyway, so he said there were quantum fields but no matter. So there's what he called a quantum vacuum. So before the Big Bang, he said there was a quantum vacuum which meant that quantum fields existed, but there was no matter. And he said these quantum fields were unstable, and apparently, at the quantum level, particles come into and out of existence more or less spontaneously. Is that right? Something like that. So he said these quantum fields are unstable, and so he said that the universe appeared as a quantum fluctuation. Okay, so that's his conclusion then. It's possible for the universe, the Big Bang, to appear out of nothing because there was no matter, but there were quantum fields, and so the Big Bang then was a quantum fluctuation. He's using the word nothing in a, in a different way that we're using it, isn't he? Yes. So he's saying, for him, nothing means there's no matter, but there were quantum fields. So what's these quantum fields for him? Chris? I'm not 
come across in the book. Right. Okay. So a quantum vacuum, which is what he said, a quantum vacuum then is not really nothing, as it is assumes the existence of quantum fields which create matter. So for him then, he is he still can't explain the origin of the universe without assuming the existence of quantum fields which create matter. So even though he's an atheist, um, he's still, in order to explain the origin of the universe, he has to assume the existence of quantum fields. And so true nothing would be no fields. If there were no quantum fields, there was really nothing, then it would be impossible to explain the Big Bang and coming into existence of the universe. Otherwise, where did the fields come from? So are the fields, the quantum fields themselves, eternal? I guess you would say yes. In which case, are the quantum fields themselves God? So is that just a different, are you just calling the quantum fields God? No. It's the same thing. So? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. You're assuming something is eternal. And whether you call it God or the quantum fields, still there's something there out of which everything came. And so, again, from a religious perspective, the, a religious theological perspective, would say these fields are an expression of the universe of prime energy. So the biblical perspective is God is a God of love and power. So the power is would be quantum fields, which were eternal. So when God created the universe at the Big Bang out of quantum fields, the quantum fields was, was the power of God in that sense. That makes sense? So that said, what Stephen Hawking and these people are saying is correct, it's science, but it's not the whole explanation. Yeah. It's just one side of the explanation. Okay, so how do we explain all this then? Well, we can say, I mean, another way out of trying to explain the existence of the universe without bringing God into it, is the multiverse theory. The idea that multiple universes exist and ours just happens to support life. So if there were an infinity of universes, then you'd expect, <clears throat> at least once, the initial starting conditions <clears throat> to be perfect. <clears throat> yeah? but at least once. If you've got an infinity of universes, then out of this infinity of universes, okay, at least one of them would end up developing to be like ours. So that's the only way you can get around this question of, well, how can we explain the universe, which is so unlikely, but then, does, is there any?